13, I, our subject is found in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, and we're, verse 22 is where we'll begin. And I'm glad you had enough courage to come back. But before I start, I want to remind you of a few things. <clears throat> In Psalm 135, verse 6, we read this. Uh, he says, whatever the Lord pleases, he does. In heaven and in earth, in the seas and all the deeps, he causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth, who makes lightning of, for the rain, and he brings forth the wind from his treasures. I met with a pastor this Friday night from Kansas City, and we met in a little uh, town of Abilene at Brookville Hotel. Some of you probably been there if you're from Kansas. And uh, we began to talk about the churches and this whole COVID-19 and how it has affected the church of Jesus Christ. We agreed uh, sovereignly that God brought it. This is not an accident. This is not something that just came out of the sky and caught everybody by surprise. God knew it all the time. <clears throat> and the effect on the fundamental Bible-believing churches has been most amazing. And we're on this subject in, it, and, uh, in our scriptures uh, as, as God ordained that we would be speaking from Ephesians 5. And we're talking about the filling of the Holy Spirit. And he said, be filled with the Holy Spirit, not with wine, but with the Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit be in control. And, we're, and what we're finding is a lot of unrest in the biblical churches, churches that believe the Bible. And guess where the struggle is? Submission. That's where it is. As long as everybody was hunky-dory and everybody could do what they wanted to do and drive where they wanted to drive and go where they wanted to go and watch ball games and do all those things, no problem. But once it was all shut down and then uh, down came guidelines and all kinds of stuff, we find uh, maybe we, some people were not as submissive as we thought. And yet the Holy Spirit says... When he said, be filled with the Holy Spirit in chapter 5, he said, the next thing you need to do is speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, and people are getting their dandruff up. And then he says, we ought to make melody in our heart, and people are getting down about all this. Isn't that right? Then he says something else that we don't like. He says, submitting to one another. We've got we to gotta honor one another better than ourselves. Stop and think about this. What did Jesus give up for the gospel, for us to be saved? What did he give up? He didn't have to save us. We made our own sin. We had our own denial against God. He didn't have to come down here, yet he did. Father sent the Son. There's, a, there's submission right there, isn't there? Jesus submitted to God, even though he himself voluntarily came, according to Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 11, Jesus came. And we find out that Jesus submitted to him in every way and submitted to him to even be abused made fun of, spit on, slapped around, denied, mocked. He went so far as it says in Philippians that he subjected himself to death. He is God. He never committed a sin. He didn't deserve to die for any sin. He never committed one. And yet he gave himself he submitted to the Father's will. Remember the garden and the prayer? Three times. In agony, he went and he said, is there any other way? 
And what was his conclusion? Your will be done. Your will be done. So now we come to Ephesians chapter 5, 22, and it says, Wives, be subject to your own husband as to the Lord. Now it's interesting when he gets into the domestic area, husbands, wives, children, servants, employees, employers, when he gets in this area, he immediately brings in theology as well as practical. He says, be subject to your wives as to the Lord. The word subject, be subject, is not in the original text. If I were to read this straight from the Greek, it'd go like this. Wives to your own husbands as to the Lord. The fact that the subject is not there emphasizes actually the position. It is taken from the previous verse, which says submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. So the submission here is a, to husbands is a universal teaching of the Bible. It's not something that started with uh, the beginning of America. It's not something that started with the beginning of Christ. This is universal. From Genesis to Revelation, this is the pattern. The word subject is taken from the previous word, submission, it's the same word, which means to arrange under, to be submissive. And the attitude of a spirit-filled Christian is one of submission. That's, that's the attitude toward the Lord. And we read here, the believer's ultimate submission to Christ is clearly seen in practice when we put others first and ourselves last. Romans 12.10 says this, Be devoted to one another in brotherly love and give preference to one another in honor. <clears throat> I think COVID asks us to do that this time, doesn't it? If you see somebody that's maybe a little bit, wants to wear a mask and maybe has some underlying conditions you don't even know about, respect it. Give honor to them. And I don't think any one of us really want to give it to someone else. A month or so ago when I had to go in to the doctor, uh, uh, and they thought, well, this guy might be a COVID-19 suspect. You know what the first thing that came to my mind was, and this was on a Monday, I was in church and I would be horrified if I gave it to somebody else. It'd be one thing if I had it, but it'd be something else if I gave it to someone else, even unwittingly. I don't want that. I don't want you to be sick on my account, and I don't think any believer wants anybody else to be sick on their account. So there's a certain amount of preference that we should be showing in love toward one another. And Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 says basically the same thing. Do nothing, he says, from selfishness or empty conceit. Conceit. I'm not big enough. I don't have to do this. What is that? Empty conceit. But with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourself. How much plainer can you get than that? I don't know that you can get much plainer. More explain it. So this is a kind of submission that he's talking to us concerning our own attitude. Now Paul moves into the family life of a believer, and he starts with biblical instructions to the wives. Starts with them first. And this has become a delicate topic since the feminine movement has dominated our culture. 
Faith had a Bible study with uh, Royal's wives back about 10, 15 years, well, longer than that, 12, 13 years ago. And, <clears throat> and uh, she asked the ladies, the wives, she said, what do you, you want to discuss? I think there was about 12 or 13 ladies in there. What do you want to discuss? And they said, the family. So in the process of discussing the family, she said in one of the meetings, next time we meet, we're going to talk about wives and submission. And one of the girls raised their hand and she said, you didn't say submission, did you? And Faith said, I said submission and we're still here. We haven't died. It is so contrary to what the world thinks. The world has this egalitarian viewpoint that men and women are exactly the same in every area. The biblical viewpoint is a complementary one in which we have roles that complement each other. The world's philosophy is we're all equal. And as a result of this thinking and acceptance, many of the evangelical churches have gone so far as to accept an egalitarian viewpoint. And you're seeing more and more women pastors, women elders, women evangelists, and women controlling the church. And their explanation is that the Bible basically is a living document. Paul did not anticipate everything. Paul was a captive to his own culture where the men ruled the roost. And even when you go back and talk about Paul, he gets criticism even though he's dead. But it, it is as though Paul didn't really know, but now in our enlightened 21st century, we know now what Paul really didn't know then. However, the Bible is a document that God wrote to man, and we are to find out what the author meant when he wrote it. Not what we think he said, but what did the author really want us to know? It's a big issue in some churches, and a big issue in the Southern Baptist churches today. Really a big, uh, big display. But all Christians are to be in submission one to another and Christian wives specifically to their own husbands. <clears throat> I'll, we'll talk about some variables on that as we go along here. <clears throat> but I want you to know something, that this is a voluntary submission. You know, when Paul said, I'm a bondservant to Christ, he used a word which is translated slave, doulos. When you look at Roman, Galatians chapter 1, verse 10, we read this. For am I now seeking favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were still striving, striving, trying to please men, I would not be a bond servant of Christ, a slave to Christ. Philippians 2, 7, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bond servant, that's Christ, and being made in the likeness of men. Colossians 1, 7, speaking of P Epaphras, you, as you have learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow bond servant, who is a faithful servant of Christ on our behalf. The word here is not bond servant. The word here is the same word where we are to submit to one another in the previous couple of verses. The wife is not a slave to her husband. This is a voluntary submission to God first, to the Lord first, and then to her husband. She does it because she worships and loves God and then submits to her husband. She's not to obey her husband when he demands or asks her to sin. 
You see, it's just like the church relationship to the government. We're to be in submission to the government until the government says you can't preach the gospel or you can't meet together, period. It's against the law. And then we have to obey God rather than men. That's the same principle in marriage. And I've been involved in marriage counseling where women have been asked to submit to immorality. Or women have been the subject of severe abuse, beatings, and so forth. Yes, it's even in a local church. I was sitting one day on a nice holiday, Labor Day, and joined the day. All at once we got a knock at the door, and one of the teenagers in our church came in, and that was kind of rare. I mean, he and I were good friends, but for him to come over on a holiday would, was kind of an unusual thing. And he said, you got to come over to our house. And I said, why? He said, my dad is beating up my mom. He was a leader in our church. <clears throat> so I went over there, and sure enough, things had been thrown around, and there was obvious, obvious uh, confrontation in that home. And I said, did you hit your wife? He said, yes. And then he asked me uh, later in the conversation, does this mean that I am no longer a leader in the church? <laughs> I said, absolutely. You're done now. And your written resignation will be in my office tomorrow morning. You are done. We can't have that in leadership, can we? Can't have any of that kind of abuse. <clears throat> no godly husband would do that. The biblical answer is there to, to submit to the husband like the church submits to Christ. The church is to be submissive to the powers that be. But when the government of the world demands loyalty over the church as obedience to Christ, the church obeys Christ because she loves Jesus Christ, recognizes his leadership, and pays the cost freely and welcomely. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is also the head of the church. Verse 23, he himself being the Savior of the body. So when he talks about submission of the wife to the husband, and he will read later, it's in everything. Then he immediately jumps to the husband. And he says the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, and he himself being the savior of the body. It is God who gave the husband the right to be the head of the wife. And the husband needs to recognize that he's God's servant. Paul gives another example. The wives submissive to her husband as seen in Christ's relationship to God the Father. A question arises, uh, what does headship mean? What does it mean to be the head of your wife? Does it mean you are the ruler? Does it mean you are the source? Choose both in Ephesians. Look at Ephesians 1.22. Just turn back to that. He put all things in subjection under his feet. That's Christ. And he gave him as head over all things to the church. We'll talk more about this, but just I can't just quit on that, just against my nature. Um, husbands, be worthy of your wife's submission. Be a leader. Be a the source of their Christian life. You know what it says in 
1 Corinthians 14. I permit not a woman to speak in the church, but to learn from her husband. If your wife has a theological question, can you men answer it? Do you know enough theology if your wife has a question, what happens when, what kind of bodies do people have in heaven? Can you answer questions uh, the, of a theological nature that your wife says, oh, I'll go ask my husband. He knows the Bible. Or does she say, I'm going to listen to such and such a guy on the radio. Or I'm going to go to a study Bible. Or I'm going to get it from the lady at backyard fence. Where are, where are we, husbands? Do you know the word? Are you in the word? Can your wife really honestly say of you sitting right here, if I have a question about the Bible, my husband will be able to help me out on it? Not only that, he is the protector. Look at Ephesians 4.15. Look at Ephesians 4.15. But speaking the truth in love, we're to grow up in all aspects into him who is ahead, even Christ. Husband is ahead of the wife, okay? Who's giving direction to the children? I think most of the time it's passed off to the wife. Where are you, men? What kind of direction are you giving to your boys, to your girls, to your wife? Are you the one that's giving loving instruction? That is our job. Is it our wives that are coaxing us to go to church? Is it our wives coaching us to read the Bible? Or is it our wives that want to... Uh, Pray together? Last Sunday morning got an interesting question. A person said to me, uh, you mentioned quite a bit, yeah, like this Sunday morning a week ago, we ought to pray together. Why? Good question. Why? You know why? It's one time a day that you and your wife get together and really are in tune with the Lord. One time. If there were no God at all, wouldn't that be a good practice to do? That at least once a day, you set aside 10, 15 minutes that it's just father and mother, dad and mom, husband and wife, just sitting together and sharing your heart and why you are married. Let alone, it's unifying and bringing both of you to God at the same time. Another reason it is, it's for you and your wife or husband and wife to sit down and actually pray for your children. Our prayers are getting longer. The older we are, we're getting more children. We've got one coming. And we're praying for that little person already. Adding more to the, more to the family. Plus, we pray for you. Every one of you. It's important to take the leadership men. Christ is ahead in chapter 1, emphasizes he's the source. Chapter 4, he emphasizes his leadership. Defined roles are important in the home. 1 Corinthians 11, 3. I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man. And the man is the head of the woman... And God is the head of Christ. Is God and Father equal? You can say amen. Yeah, they're equal. Husband and wives are equal. Paul uses doctrine to prove this. God the Father and God the Son are co-equal in every sense of deity and every attribute. God the Father is omnipresent. God the Son is omnipresent. God the Son 
is omnipotent. God the Father is omnipotent. God the Son is omniscient. He's here this morning. Where two or three are gathered together in his name, where is Jesus Christ? He's here now. God the Father is here now. And if they're meeting in Beijing, China, if there's a group meeting there, Christ is as much there as he is here. Well, that's, that's a mystery. When you look at it, when God, the Son, is in person at the right hand of the Father, both are omniscient. Yet there's order. Yet there's a role. It wasn't God the Father who came to die on the cross, was it? God sent his Son. And you know what Jesus said when before he's going? There's another person of the Trinity who is just as real as God the Father, God the Son, and he is God the Holy Spirit. He's not an influence. He's an actual person. And so when Jesus came and died on the cross, the Father sent him, and Jesus said, you know, when I'm going back, I'm going to send you what? Another comforter. Another person who will live within every believer. He is the Holy Spirit. So there's order in the Trinity, though equal in every way. That's the way it is with mom and dad. That's the way it is with husband and wife. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world through him might be saved. But God did delegate to the son certain things. In John chapter 5, let's take a look at it. John chapter 5, a couple of interesting verses here. John chapter 5, verse 26 and 28. For just as the Father has life in himself, so he gave to the Son to have life in himself. And he gave him authority to execute judgment because he's a son. So one of the roles of Jesus Christ is the judge of the earth. Why? Very simple. He lived here. He knows what that's like, right? You're not going to be able to stand, and I'm not going to be able to stand before the Lord and say, you know, Lord, you just don't know what it's like to live on this earth. You don't know how it is to be poor. You don't know how it is to be abused. You don't know how it is to be rejected. You don't know how it is to be stabbed in the back. What is Jesus going to say? Ah, I know. And I trusted God. I trusted God in all this. You didn't. In John chapter 5, verse 19 and 20, go up a little bit in John chapter 5, therefore Jesus answered, And was saying to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself is doing. And the Father will show him greater works than these so that you will marvel. Here's the point. Jesus did the will of God because he loves the Father. I'm willing as a woman, as a wife, to submit to my husband because I love God. And that's what he's asked me to do. Jesus does, Christ does the will of the Father. In John 5, 30, we read, I can do nothing on my own initiative. I hear, I judge, my judgment is just because I do not seek my own will, the will of him who sent me. In the human world of male and female, both are equal beings, spirit, soul, and body. 
But in 1 Corinthians 11, 12, we read, For as a woman originates from the man, he also, the man, has his birth through the woman, and all things originate from God. We're equal. Every man here had a mother. We come from women. And the women, as to a person, were equal in all, every sense. But we're not equal as to roles. God designed that the husband would be the head of the family. You know as well as I do, if you played sports at all and on any kind of team, baseball, football, soccer, basketball, whatever, you have a captain on that team. You have somebody who, who takes the leadership. And you follow. And that's the way it is in the home. You have to have a leader in the home. The man was created to lead and protect his family, so he was given the gifts of physical strength and mental capacity to be the leader. Why do you think God created us men to be stronger and to be physically, basically larger, to give us the courage to take the leadership? You know, uh, maybe some of you are spanked by your mother. I was. It got to a point, at one point, it was a joke. Break the ruler, yardstick or whatever. But I'm going to tell you, when my dad came in, now he was a short German man. But when he came in, all things were different. That was the end of the line. And I heard more than once, when your dad gets here, uh-oh. But in some homes, it means nothing. How can a woman submit to that, men? When the man won't take the leadership. The women were made different than men, even though that's being denied today, but the women were made to have children and to nurture children and show the loving and kind and gracious hand. And to be a help me to her husband. Therefore, she was given the physical and mental gifts to do that. This is true of church leadership. Paul gives further application when it comes to church leadership. I'm going to put the whole thing on the board because I want you all to see it. A woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. I didn't write that. Who wrote it? I want to hear you say it. God wrote that through, through Paul. I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain. There you go. I'm expecting to be tarred and feathered. Not really. We got good ladies here. Wonderful women. And here's the reason. They're biblical reasons, not cultural reasons. For it was Adam who was first created and then Eve. Remember the story? Adam was created first. And second reason, verse 14, it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. It's her nature. She's more, now these are fighting words. She is more vulnerable than the man. Why did they quit letting salesmen go door to door and visit when the husband was at work? Because he sold her things, talked her into things. I'll even be get more graphic than that. If you had a group of women over here, 
and you had a group of men, and there was a wall in between, and they were discussing a lady, a girl, who had a baby out of wedlock. The women's discussion would go something like this. He said he loved her. The men's would go like this. He wanted only one thing only. Who's the vulnerable? Girls, teenagers, if a guy says I love you, that's no stronger than his character. <clears throat> because he probably said that to someone else two weeks earlier. Don't buy it. More vulnerable. How many weird things will, will be? For example, I'll give you another example. A, a, a preacher I heard say, talk about this one time. He was on the way to church. He drove by a lake. Drove by the lake every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every time they went. Hardly anywhere he drove by the lake. <clears throat> one day they're driving by the lake and he says, you know, honey, there's alligators in that lake. Really? What would be a man's response? Man, if you believe that, I've got land in Florida I'd love to sell you. And a lot of times women pick up things, men, from the community, from so-called places, even from doctors pick up things and you and the man just say, oh, okay. And said, so maybe we better check that out. Maybe we, well, let's, let's, let's not buy this thing. And bring some realism into the home. That's your job, to protect your family from things that are spurious. A lot of false teaching comes through women. The cult, Christian science, came from a woman. The cult, Seventh-day Adventist, came from a woman. A lot of these things pick up there, and the man who's a leader of the home, who studies the Word of God, who knows something about facts, is willing to stand up and say, no, it's not going to happen here. Sometimes, men, we have to stand up over issues just to let people know in our family who's running the show. Wives, support him. Here's where your submissiveness really comes in. Support him. Support him. It was not the Adam who was deceived, but the woman. Now look at verse 15. Women will be be preserved through bearing of children if they continue in the faith and love and sanctify with self-destraint. I don't believe this means you're going to be saved by having children. I mean, he's talking about the child-bearing, singular in the Greek. Who brought to us Jesus Christ? A woman. He didn't come from the man. A man had nothing to do with the birth of Jesus Christ. The woman who brought the deception into the world, believe the deception, is also now the one who brings in the Savior. How about that? When you read that verse carefully, you see with the order of creation, the order of the fall, and you bring in the bearing of children. In Genesis 3.15 it said, God says to Satan, in Genesis 3.15, and I'll put enemy, intimate, enmity between you, Eve, or you, Satan, and the woman, Eve. And between your seed, Satan, now Satan doesn't have any seed, he's an angel, he can't have children. So who are his children? We read it in Ephesians. You're sons of disobedience. 
You are of your father, Jesus said, the devil. To whom was he speaking? Unbelievers. Unbelievers are the seed of Satan. And he says, to the seed of the woman. Now he narrows it down in Genesis 3.15. He, the seed of the woman, now one, shall bruise you on the head. The word bruise is crush, destroy. And you, Satan, will bruise him on the hill. Where did he bruise Christ? On the cross. Which ended up being his crushing. So how do you kill a snake? Well, one way to do it is take the head of a snake and put your heel on it. Grind it. You may have a sore heel, but you killed a snake. It's one of these messages that, that just keeps going and going. Look at Genesis 3.20. In verse 20, now the man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Through the one seed, God promised a seed, and now there's hope. Remember God said to Adam, the day you eat of that tree, you shall surely die. Now he's saying the woman's going to have seed, which means you're going to live long enough to see children. And out of those children is going to come one seed, one seed who will be your redeemer. <clears throat> so in chapter uh, 4, verse 1 of Genesis, we read, And a man had relations with his wife, Eve. She conceived, gave birth to Cain. And guess what she said? I've gotten a man from the Lord. Here it is. She had another son. Later, what was his name? Remember his name? Abel. You know what that means? Vanity. I've raised one child with a sin nature, and that's enough. <laughs> I'm calling him empty. Now, we read this in Galatians 4.4. 4. Now, when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman. Very important born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons, going all the way back to Genesis creation. Now here's our summary. 1 Peter 3.1 In the same way, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be one without a word, by the behavior of their wives. How was uh, the example here is Sarah. Look at verse 5, 1 Peter 5. For in this way, former times, the holy women also, who hoped in God, used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. Just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, <clears throat> and you have become her children if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. Trust yourself to God, to your husband. That's what he's saying. Now, what do you think about Abraham? You tell her, my, you're my sister. Truth is, he was, she was a half-sister. And he sold her to Pharaoh's harem. You'd think that'd be enough, wouldn't you? He did it again to Ambimelech. Who protected Sarah? God did. Trust yourself, ladies, to God. What about, here, here's something for, we have a prayer list for ladies who have husbands, they're Christians and husbands who don't believe. They ought to be on everybody's prayer list. 
I like this verse. In the same way, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands, so that if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be one. The word may, this is a future passive indicative. They will be one. No may here, this is not subjunctive mood. <clears throat> Years ago, I had a little church and seminary and we had every Sunday morning I'd drive out there, teach Sunday school, preach, spend all afternoon with a couple and then come back, have a five o'clock youth meeting and then we'd have Sunday night church. I went home, I went home absolutely bushed. I went home sometimes and never even remembered driving through one of those towns 65 miles from our work. We stayed in this one lady's home and her husband never came to church. He's a pleasant guy, nice guy, hunter and a fisherman and all that. And I walked into the kitchen and there was a, a little uh, note on the stove. This burner has not worked and the date was on it when it was gone. And then I, on the cupboard there was another little note and it said, uh, this cupboard door, cupboard door has been off its hinges since. And they had about four or five little notes all through the house. And every Wednesday night, prayer meeting, pray for my husband. And I just had gone through this. We'd just gone through this passage in seminary in 1 Peter 3. So I said, hey, come over here. I want to talk to you. And I read her this verse. And I called her by name. I'm not going to give you her name. But I called her by name and I said, the next time, next Sunday when you go to church, will you ask your husband and say, D would it be okay if I'd go to church? Could I have your permission to go to church? And if he says no, then don't go. And next time, next Sunday morning, when he says, uh, I'm going fishing, why don't you say, can I go along? She hated it. What do I do? Read a book. Do a crossword puzzle. Take a tape measure and measure that little sunfish. She said, nobody's ever told me this. Nobody's ever told me this. Let's try it. A couple Sundays, she was missing. And then she came to church and she said, Rod, I asked him if, he'd give, if I could go to church. She said, sure. It's good for you. Several months later, all at once, he showed up and we were all shocked. And I was only in that church for two and a half years. But before they were at that two and a half years over, he was a regular attender. And I told her to get rid of all those little things. Get rid of every note. You're not going to win a man by nagging. You're not going to win a man by your words physically. You're going to win him by the inner nature of your heart in submission to him as you would submit to Christ. Ladies, you want to, and, and, and I have another question here. What do you do if you have a husband or you're much more gifted than your husband in certain areas? Submission is not to be negated in those cases, but she must use <clears throat> her godly wisdom to find a way to help her husband in areas of his weakness. You women are smart enough. You can figure that out. A husband should be realistic and recognize his wife's strength and incorporate his wife in his leadership. After all, we're one, aren't we? My wife is more gifted in this area than me. I ought to listen to her. And she ought to be able to pick the times when it's really right to receive it. I'll give you a very personal story. It just happened. 
I sent a wrong payment, a big payment, to a company that is minuscule compared to the money I sent them. And I can't, I'm having a, a, a hard time getting the money back. I've called them and I finally said, tell me who your supervisor is. Well, we can't do that. Tell me I want my money back. And it's really getting aggravating. And I am really aggravated with these people. I didn't swear at them. I was firm, and I was firm. My wife comes in and says, God works everything out. I said, don't cast the pearls before the swine. This is not a time for me to hear about the sovereignty of God, though I know it very well. Been there? We all have. But use your giftedness, ladies. Use your submission to God for submission to your husband and do whatever you can to help him. Lord knows we men need help. That's why we got married. We loved you, and we really want your help, and we want your support. And you've got feminine ways that you can do it that we know our heads being twisted, but we don't know quite how it happened. And we pray for you, ladies, who have husbands that are not believers. We pray for you that God will give you the grace that you will see the day when they come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Wouldn't that be great? All of us pray together that that would happen. And, and God wants you to have a happy home. God is not in heaven just trying to make your life miserable. He wants us to rejoice. He wants us to be happy. And I'll tell you when we're the happiest. We're the happiest when we're walking with the Lord. That's when we're the happiest, if we follow his word. Let us stand for prayer. Father, we thank you for, for your word. And we recognize within the heart of every one of us is rebellion in our own sin nature. We don't want to be told what to do, when to do, and where to go. But Father, you have given your word that if we will obey you with our whole mind, soul, and body, there we'll find peace. There we'll find joy. Help the believing ladies Lord, who may be struggling with this whole thing of submission, to right now give in and say, I surrender all. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.